everyone. Welcome to part two of our webinar series, um, Understanding the Impact of Israel's New Government at Home and Abroad, focusing today on geopolitics, diplomacy, and security. My name is Adam Odesser. I am director of the Dr. Stuart Lessons Israel Action Center at the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington, which serves as the public affairs and community relations arm of the organized Jewish community in our nation's capital. I'd like to begin by thanking all of you who are joining us here today. Uh, from around the country, Israel, and around the world. I'd also like to thank our partners throughout this webinar series, the Israel Policy Forum, the Greater Washington Forum on Israeli-Arab Issues, and the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington. Um, before we get into things today, I would like to also take this opportunity and recognize the devastating earthquakes that have affected Turkey and several other countries um, and offer our deepest sympathies um, as the number of people who have lost their lives continues to rise into the thousands and many, many more have been affected. Uh, we hope that the efforts by the international community and neighbors in the region, including Israel and many others, will provide um, some much needed help to recover. Um, Jewish federations, including our local federation here in Washington, have opened an earthquake relief fund to support and provide vital aid to those in need, and a link to donate will be put in the chat box shortly. Um, and now, turning back to the reason we are here today, um, our webinar series comes a little bit, a little over one month since Israel's 37th government was sworn in back in December 29th. As I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, are aware by now, Bibi Netanyahu is prime minister again, leading what is considered by many the most right-wing and religious government in Israeli history. Last week, we had the honor to be joined by Ambassador Dennis Ross, who provided us with an overview and shared some of his insights and reflections and um, predictions of what we can expect from the current Israeli government. To discuss the current state and the impact of uh, this government that will have on security and regional relations, we are honored today to be joined by two esteemed guests, Dr. Shira Efron, which again, I hope she will be joining us shortly, who is the Diane and Guilford Glazer Foundation Director of Policy Research at Israel Policy Forum and a senior researcher at the Institute for National Security Studies, the INSS and Dr. Jonathan Shanzer, Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Uh, before we begin, a bit of housekeeping for today. Both of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes, and I will follow up with a question or two, depending on time. And for the last half hour or so, we will be taking questions submitted through the Q&A feature. Uh, please keep your questions short and to the point, as we hope to take as many questions as possible. I'd also like to note that this call is being recorded and closed captioning is available at the bottom of your screen. So Jonathan, thank you for being here. Um, we hope you'll be joined by, uh, with, by Shira shortly. Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about and I want to you know, begin with you and um, you know, take us a little bit, uh, you know, let's begin outwards a little bit and talk about regional developments. Where do current Israel-Arab relations stand today? Um, and also U.S.-Israel relations. You know, we've seen over the past few weeks talks about possibility of a new normalization agreement between Israel and Sudan. Um, you know, what is the significance of that? And in addition, we've seen, you know, both Secretary Blinken and uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan um, in, in Israel, in the region. Um, so how has this government being, uh, been impacting the regional relations and the U.S.-Israel relations and diplomacy in the region? Okay, thank you, Adam, um, and great to be with everyone today. Uh, appreciate you taking a little bit of time out uh, early in your week uh, for uh, for this webinar. Um, I'll start by just saying that I think there's a, an interesting dichotomy right now that we're observing in Israel, um, and 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 maybe it's um, not new, uh, but I think it's more pronounced than it's ever been, and that is that Israel is never been more safe, but also it's never been more threatened. Um, and, and the threats um, are, are ones that I think are both internal and external, and we'll talk about those today. Both of them, I think, uh, are worth highlighting. Um, the first is, let's just talk about the nuclear deal. It's the, the first and last thing that every Israeli security official wants to talk about. Um, and, uh, you know, the Israelis have been unequivocal about uh, their opposition to uh, a return to uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the 2015 nuclear deal. Um, that deal was highly controversial when it was signed. Um, it provided $150 billion or more to the regime in Iran and, and did not 
um, uh, provide a timeline for the ultimate cessation of uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions. And uh, obviously, Trump exited that deal in 2018. And then with the return of uh, Joe Biden to the White House as president, not as vice president, uh, he vowed to uh, bring the United States back into compliance with the deal and to work with the Iranians. This obviously sent uh, the Israelis into something of a panic. Um, they continually opposed it while also working with the United States to try to shape it, which was an interesting approach. Um, but uh, after two years now of trial and error, I think it's safe to say that um, the deal is, um, for those of you who are Princess Bride fans, that movie from the 1980s, uh, the deal is mostly dead. Um, it's not entirely dead, but it's mostly dead. Um, it appears right now that there's very little appetite for a deal um, on the part of the regime in Iran. It, there's also very little appetite right now for uh, for this deal on the part of the United States. This is, of course, good news for Israel, uh, at least from the perspective of its military planners, most of them. Of course, not every Israeli agrees with this, but nine out of 10 do, I think. Um, and uh, there are some outliers um, notably, actually, the head of military intelligence has been an outlier on this, but there, most of the other Israeli brass agree that this is um, a good thing for Israel. It's actually surprising. The administration was prepared to send about $275 billion to the Iranians in sanctions relief with a bunch of other perks. Uh, the regime denied it. And now, this all came at a terrible time for the regime because we're now seeing these protests that have uh, really stretched on now for the better part of a half a year. Um, and these protests are threatening the very existence of the regime in Iran. Just to remind folks, there's essentially three pillars of this regime. One is death to America, the other one is death to Israel, and, and, and the third one is the subjugation of women. And it's women that are uh, coming out right now and protesting the regime and leading the unrest. And I think it has shaken the regime to its core. I think this is a very positive thing. Uh, from Israel's perspective, uh, it's, it's a positive thing from my perspective, too. Um, and there is, I think, some open questions about whether the Israelis and perhaps the Saudis, the Azerbaijanis and others are uh, are trying to help the uh, protests along. Uh, these are questions that I think we probably won't be able to answer for quite some time. So you have the collapse of the nuclear deal. You've got the protests going on in Iran. And then uh, very recently, we had this Juniper, Juniper Oak military exercise conducted jointly between the United States and Israel. It was an unmistakable message that the United States and Israel have uh, remarkable capabilities uh, separately and together uh, that uh, would enable um, a, 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 a fatal strike on the regime, not probably just its nuclear program, but it could do a lot more damage than that. We saw um, we saw air, we saw uh, missile defense, we saw um, uh, personnel on the ground, all conducting complex maneuvers, demonstrating the the, the depth and breadth of uh, the U.S.-Israel military um, uh, relationship. And I think it was an unmistakable message to the regime in Tehran, which, again, is already, uh, I think, reeling from the fact that it, it didn't accept that sanctions relief and the protests continue to rage. So I think um, this is good news for Israel all around. Uh, but that said, uh, and again, just getting back to that kind of framing of this, that Israel's never been more safe and never more threatened, there are threats that emanate from an unchecked nuclear program, and that is exactly what's going on. There's news today that at one of Iran's premier nuclear facilities, they're uh, upping the enrichment of uranium, uh, inching Iran ever closer to a nuclear weapon. And so uh, this is a major concern. Now, alongside of that, there is a quiet war that's been taking place, which I think is uh, uh, highly consequential and I think does not get enough attention here in our press. Um, we call it uh, the war between wars or the campaign between wars. The Israelis call it the Mabam. It, uh, it's Ma'arechet Ben um, Amilchamot, the campaign between wars. And this has been a policy of continuity now from Bibi to Bennett to Lapid back to Bibi. Um, and it is a campaign of strikes, primarily in Syria, although also in cyberspace on the high seas um, and inside Iran itself, where the uh, Israelis are consistently night after night, week after week, month after month, eroding the capabilities of the Iranian regime. 
Uh, some of it's nuclear related, some of it's not. Uh, but this constant conflict in the shadows has kept Israel safe, but it's also kept Israel on a knife's edge. There is always uh, the possibility of a broader conflagration. It hasn't happened yet. I think the Israelis, I don't want to say are lucky, but I think they have been navigating this tightrope act in a way that is both admirable, but also is anxiety producing. Um, now, part of what's going on right now in terms of why Israel is striking in Syria is they're trying to interdict smuggling. This is actually probably the major threat um, second only to the nuclear program that also, again, doesn't get a lot of attention right now. And this is the threat of uh, precision guided munitions, PGMs. These are munitions that uh, are more exact than anything that we've seen in the past out of Hezbollah uh, or Hamas for that matter. Uh, very precise. They can strike within 10 or 15 uh, yards of their intended target. Um, and uh, the Israelis are watching with alarm that even though they're interdicting most of these um, there are still hundreds of them that have gotten through. 500 is the latest estimate that I've gotten from Israeli officials, and this is just something that the Israelis continue to watch with great apprehension. Now, um, at the same time, while the Hamas threat grows, um, the or the Hezbollah threat grows, rather, the Hamas threat appears to be more contained, but not for the right reasons. It appears right now that Hamas has adopted a new strategy and that strategy is that they already control the Gaza Strip. They don't need any more war in the Gaza Strip because they control the territory. So they've decided to begin to export violence into the West Bank. And we're watching that um, that that uh, the fruits of that strategy uh, day after day, week after week. In fact, since March, uh, we have watched a steady uptick of attacks. Uh, some are uh, being claimed by Hamas, some are being claimed by the Fatah faction, some are being claimed by a new organization called the Lion's Den. Um, it's all being run, or most of it's being run by a nerve center that is controlled by the Iranian regime that is in Lebanon. It's um, It includes Hamas, it includes Hezbollah, and we can see the fruits of that, bitter fruits, being reaped in the West Bank right now. Now, what's interesting is, is the Palestinian leadership is blaming all of this on the new Israeli government that has just been formed. Um, this is, of course, a false narrative. Um, the unrest has been happening since March, since well before uh, the collapse of the last government and the formation of the, the, the new government. But nevertheless, I think it's very convenient for the Palestinians to blame Itamar Ben-Gvir and Bezalel Smotrich and some of the other figures that have come uh, to power from the Israeli right. Uh, so. It's a false narrative, there's no question. But then there is the question right now of whether this government is a liability. Um, now, uh, we we actually heard Adam say that it's the most right-wing government in Israeli history. Um, it, that may be so, but I would also note, by the way, that for the last 20 years, every government that's come to power, um, that has come to power, at least on the side of Likud, has been identified as the most right-wing government in Israeli history. It's a constant narrative. I think we need to wait and see. The figures themselves are polarizing. The policies uh, could be um, polarizing, but they could not be. I think we're waiting to see exactly what policies take place. But I will say that regardless, this government could stoke additional unrest, even though it's not the, the thing that prompted the violence. It could be the thing that helps sustain the violence in the West Bank. That's number one. Number two, it could spook uh, Israel's normalization partners. Um, the UAE initially balked at a meeting with Bibi Netanyahu uh, over the formation of this government and some of the things that were being said, policies that were being threatened. But that said, um, you know, and, and while I think that's a threat, uh, it's interesting, but uh, we saw really uh, very positive developments this week with both the countries of Sudan and Chad, Sudan taking normalization a step further beyond what they did back in 2020 and Chad taking an unprecedented step. So in other words, normalization continues to march forward. And that is, of course, something that we should all be cheering. Um, but uh, this government, I, I think also, uh, it's just as I try to wrap up here, um, you know, it is making the U.S. government ambivalent. Now, most governments do in Israel when they first come to power 
we don't know who they are. We don't know who to work with. I mean, I can even say that in the beginning when um, uh, when Naftali Bennett became prime minister, there was some ambivalence here in the United States because he was a right wing figure and no one knew exactly what he was going to do when he stepped into power. Right now inside the White House, everybody knows exactly who BB is. They know who Ron Dormer is, who's the uh, the Minister for Strategic Affairs um, and, and some of the others. There are, of course, other figures that they've never met, and they're trying to figure out really whether Bitsalo Smotrich and Ben Gvir are people that they can work with. Um, it is making things a bit more difficult that you have this government um, – and you have some of the policies that they're at least articulating that they'd like to see in the West Bank at a time when the U.S. government is at least considering closer coordination on Iran, which is Israel's most strategic and uh, and most dire threat. So there is an interesting ambivalence that we're seeing coming out of the U.S. government right now, and it'll be very um, uh, important to see exactly how BB handles this. Uh, I'll just note in, with just two final uh, points here that uh, the diaspora, uh, which is, is obviously Israel's um, base here in the United States, is increasingly ambivalent about some of the figures that are coming to power. Um, I think that is a sign that Netanyahu himself, the prime minister, is going to have to take charge uh, of these figures and control them. If he's unable to, I think there are real liabilities ahead. Finally, we're noting one uh, thing in the financial realm that I think is worth noting, and that is that with all of the threats of legal changes uh, coming out of the U.S. government, uh, coming out of the Israeli government, we're seeing uh, financial institutions, ESG companies, uh, those that provide financial ratings, are beginning to wonder whether Israel is in fact predictable. Um, a, a predictable democracy, which is always what has given Israel um, a, a, a sort of um, an edge in some of these battles uh, in non-traditional marketplaces. And even some of the questions that arise every time Israel is brought or threatened to be brought bef uh, before the International Criminal Court, the ICC, it's always been um, the answer of Israel that there is a uh, judiciary that is beyond reproach, that it is independent. And right now, some of those things are being called into question. So again, I'll just uh, I'll conclude the way that I started, that we see right now indications that Israel's never been more safe. Uh, it is operating uh, in uh, its military is operating at a level, I think, never envisioned by its founders. Um, and it continues to operate against Iran. It continues to work with the United States in ways that I think ensure its security. But at the same time, we are watching some developments right now that should be cause for concern, as they always are. And Israel does always jump from crisis to crisis. Uh, but uh, these are some of the contours of the current crises and the current calculus as we see them here in Washington today. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for that really um you know, great overview. Um, I, I, Shio, I want to recognize and thank you so much for joining us. I know you've run into a little, little bit of difficulties joining us, and I'm really appreciative for uh, you being able to uh, still uh, push through those. Um, I, I want to turn it over to you. Um, and I know uh, Jonathan really gave us a little bit of an overview of, um, you know, regional relations, uh, the developments on that front. Um, and feel free to, you um, you know, tackle on a little bit of what he uh, spoke about, if you have anything to add. Uh, but also I want, um, you know, Jonathan just mentioned um, that Israel has never been safer. Um, and, um, you know, over the past week or two, we've really seen an escalation in uh, violence and terror attacks in Israel. Um, there's been an increase in IDF operations as well, specifically in the Palestinian city of Jenin. Um, so can you provide us with perhaps a bit of context and an overview of what is happening in Israel today, um, what have we seen since this coalition has really come together in terms of Israel, the PA, and the Palestinians? Sure. Hi, Adam. Thank you. And I ended up just joining on my phone. So sorry. I hope this is clear and you can see me and can hear me in this, this weird light uh, above my head. I uh, must admit that I, I'm really sorry because of the technical difficulties. I couldn't hear uh, John, uh, Jonathan, uh, my dear friend. So I hope I'm not going to be uh, redundant and this could get boring because I'm, I'm sure that on um, a variety of topics, we agree. Um, I will have to say so. 
I think it is true that every, because these were sort of the last comments that I did hear that uh, John was referring to the fact that I think was insinuating that we shouldn't panic. It's the most hawkish right wing uh, Israeli government that Israel's ever had because we always say that. But I think objectively, you know, the goalpost has shifted. We, this is a different uh, level. We're talking about um, uh, if you look at the Israeli, you know, the Knesset, right? You have a, a, a legacy party, the Israeli Zionist uh, leftist party merits are gone. And instead you have, you know, Itamar Ben-Gvir, um, who until recently uh, had, a, had a poster of Bar Goldstein who massacred, uh, you know, dozens of Palestinians in the, the, the cave of the pa 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 patriarchs in, in the mid nineties uh, in, in his living room, right? Like someone who, who admires uh, Kahane. You have uh, uh, Smotrich was not first uh, in, in the government, but, but really at a different uh, position. Uh, you have uh, Haredi uh, parties, which have the past have been sort of, centrist, but have really shifted to uh, the right in the last decade uh, in, in, in sizes and power, uh, which, which uh, are pretty remarkable, big, big political achievements for them. We're seeing uh, no a, women in the coalition, barely any female ministers, not even one director general, female director general of ministries in Israel. Now, you know, uh, a discussion in Israel about LGBT, Tel Aviv is sort of like the number one gay city in the world. It, it wins all these awards to have a discussion in the Knesset about LGBT, which content would, would, would come into schools. You know, I raise my kids here in school. I think this is, this is still a, a different uh, level than we've seen uh, before, um, but, but, but I agree with, with John that it makes sense not just to look at the personas, but but more on the policies that they promote. And in those policies, when we are uh, looking, uh, the, the defining issue we can talk about, you know, U.S.-Israeli relations, and we can speak about the Palestinian issue and other issues. But 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 what's uh, threatening? I think the social, the delicate social fabric of Israeli society now. What I'm feeling here on the ground is really uh, the, the proposed judicial reform. Now, it's still proposed, so maybe we should wait until uh, it happens. But the fact that there's a huge pushback inside Israel now uh, to prevent this judicial reform uh, from occurring. There's always been um, a debate in Israel to the extent that the, the judicial powers uh, have and we shouldn't go into you know the definition of democracies and checks and balances. I think everyone understands that. But in Israel, traditionally, it's very different from the U.S. You have really two 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 powers. You have the government and the which is the executive power, right? The, the cabinet. You have the executive power. You have the legislative branch, the Knesset. But really, it is. Um, it's operating, it's, it's, it's legislating the, 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 the government's uh, position. So it's really one, 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 uh, one power. And then you have the uh, judiciary, which is very strong. And as Jonathan said, it doesn't also make Israel uh, a thriving uh, democracy. I don't know if you know, but it's, it's really at cases that I think the Israeli Supreme Court uh, um, uh, deliberates on a million cases per year. There's nothing like that in the Western world. It's really a vibrant democracy. The fact that you have this in Israel and this really protects Israel's in the international, uh, the, the ICJ, the National Criminal Court and National Court of Justice, is that you have that. And, and the argument coming from um, Justice Minister Yariv Levine, but many others in the coalition for a variety of reasons that want to uh, have more political involvement uh, in um, the appointment of uh, the, you know, the justices, judges and legal advisors, uh, have an advice that is actually not binding, um, and also limiting the scope of judicial review. And there's a real fear in Israel, and it's very difficult. I'm, I'm telling you, as someone who's notoriously nonpartisan, uh, you know, being doctorated by the Rand Corporation, to have a, a discussion that is not ideological on these issues. Because once you say something pro reform, you're immediately associated as, as a, you know, as a BB supporter. And when you say something against it, you're an elitist, Ashkenazi, elitist, left, left wing. 
doesn't like, you don't like Israel. So there's a real, 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 real threat that I am very, very concerned about because uh, we can't even speak about the substance. Um, we, it, it comes to the, 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 the core of, um, is this going to undermine uh, Israeli democracy? And I think for our listeners and those, and we, I, I'm pretty sure we would all agree that we want Israel to be uh, a Jewish, democratic, and a secure state. And uh, and, he, um, and this is very hard to balance as is. And um, there's, a, let's say that, most legal experts, at least inside Israel, uh, think that this uh, is going to undermine uh, the democratic character of Israel, which has its own uh, risks. It has international risks. Uh, Jonathan referred to uh, one of them in the international, uh, you know, in international institutions. It also has an economic risk. Uh, which, which you know, Israel. If Israel is not going to be this predictable, vibrant democracy, it's going to be very hard uh, to invest here. Investors are scared if you don't have a, a strong judiciary to protect them. Um, it, uh, it, 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 it threatens um, Israeli solidarity, which really makes Israel what it is. You know, sort of this value system. Uh, which brings this all, you know, every, most most people are Jewish, but they come from, from very different places and what ties them together. Um, and I think, and maybe we can tie this, I don't know if John, uh, you had a chance to speak about it, but I think this core principle of Israel being democratic, it really allows Israel the special relationships that, that, it, that it has with Washington. It's a core, the, the speaking about the shared values, it's not nonsense. Some people in Israel dismiss and say, well, the US also has uh, partnerships with other countries in the world. Yeah, it's true. But those partnerships are nothing like the United States has with its democratic partners. And if Israel, God forbid, is uh, deemed non-democratic. It doesn't mean that it's not going to have partnerships. Israel is going to have assets and it's going to be important for the Middle East, for other things. But there's no way the U.S. and Europe will be able to continue cooperating with Israel at those levels. Um, it is not, I don't want to, I don't want to compare uh, Israel and Turkey, very, very, very far examples. But I think the, the, the chart that Turkey um, had gone through, right? Turkey was a fundamental partner, a NATO partner, the strategic nuclear American weapon in, on Turkish soil. Uh, but when Turkey went down a path stopping, uh, effectively, when it stopped being a democracy, um, it, it, it was removed from a circle of, 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 of partnerships. So we can see how this happened. I don't think it will happen with Israel, but I think uh, the core uh, principle of Israel being a democracy is something that you cannot play with. When we go to the, the strategic position, you know, I agree. I think Israel is at the best strategic position ever in history. Really, it's uh, militarily, economically, Israel's GDP now is higher than Canada's, it's higher than the UK's, it's higher than France. I mean, Israel is really, you know, we, there's a point where we talk about Israel being a developing country, a developed country. Israel is a strong uh, economy. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, um, uh, it has uh, uh, obviously uh, strong um, um, ties with with western uh, countries all western countries also with countries uh, in the far east um arab countries in ways we have never seen there's uh, the formal ties through the abram courts uh but also and other normalization agreements and there are back channeled uh ties uh to other countries um you can you know so so i think there's this 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 paradox that when we talk about israel we talk about a threat and restoring governance and 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 effectively handling terrorism there's this paradox because objectively israel is really in a strong position um which i would say so if it ain't broken don't fix it but uh there are other there are people that think differently with the palestinians um you know <laughs> As much as I think uh, there was a, a thought that maybe through uh, we we there was this paradigm right before that without um, um, uh, a peace process with the Palestinians, without solving the conflict with the Palestinians, there would be no normalization with uh, Arab um, uh, countries, and then we had 
the Abraham Accords, normalizations agreements, the UAE championed it. And this, this really changed the paradigm. And it made some people think that really the Palestinians don't matter. Uh, that matter that people forgot that there are 2.2 million Palestinians in Gaza and 3 million Palestinians in the West Bank and 400,000 Palestinians in East Jerusalem, right? It's 40% of the city's uh, residents. And they're not going anywhere. Uh, the conflict with the Palestinians is something that puts uh, real risk. It risks, obviously, Israeli lives with uh, horrific terrorist attacks that we've seen uh, in the past few weeks. Uh, there are 14 uh, Palestinian fatalities, most of them uh, uh, assailants who are involved in terrorist activities, but of course, there's civilian casualties. Uh, only we're talking about uh, a month in. Uh, this new year, 2023, uh, after uh, 2022, which was a year of uh, uh, also a rise in violence. Um, I can tell you, and we can go into this in Q&A, but I think when it was mostly Janine and Nablus, there was this, okay, what are we doing? These are areas that the, the Palestinian authorities doesn't have uh, good control over. It's also areas when you have the Tanzim related to Fatah, obviously the PA, uh, the PA's political movement, they don't have legitimacy to act there. It embarrasses them. Uh, it's a challenge and there's a push how much Israel should do, IDF, the Israeli Defense Force should do uh, in the Palestinian cities and how much should the Palestinian security forces do and how do you strengthen the PA. And um, there was an attack in um, there was there was a raid in 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 Jericho, uh, in which um, um, five I think it was five uh, Hamas um, five uh, Hamas activists uh, was captured. This was they they committed one uh, terror attack. They were going to do another one, and I think this is could be. And sadly, I'm saying this is a game changer because Jericho is probably the sleepiest place in, in the land, right? It's very quiet. It's a place where the Palestinian Authority does control. Um, there's the U United U U.S. Security Coordinator, a three-star general, where they train their the Palestinian security forces there. So there are a lot of Palestinian security forces around. Um, those were Hamas uh, activists, so a legitimate uh, cause uh, for action. Uh, the intelligence obviously was shared and the idea found itself operating. And this brings to question really what it's, is it, is it capacity or the Palestinian authority doesn't want to act. And if they don't want to act because of the political context, because they feel they have no hope, because they feel that they, they look like uh, collaborators of the Israeli occupation in their minds, and, and this is how they perceived by their population it really has no legitimacy. There's going to be a real crisis of uh, trust uh, between Israel, and I'm not talking about the political levels, I'm talking about the pro professional levels, and, 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 and this is very, very dangerous for security moving forward, because you can't just like have a plan for strengthening trust, right? The, this trust was, was built over time. And, uh, and, and, and we are at a very, um, this is really a precarious uh, moment, I think, where the onus is on the Palestinians to show that they really want to act. And also on Israel, that um, even though Israel and I, I have no doubt that the prime minister and most people, not all people in the government, but most people do not want the collapse of the Palestinian Authority. Um, if, all sides have to assume some risks and try to stabilize the situation before it deteriorates. Um, and this is where uh, uh, this 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 is my concern. If if you want, we can go into Gaza and, and other um, and other aspects of the Palestinian issue in in. Uh, Q&A. Q &A. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Shira. Um, yeah, I, I, I see you, Jonathan, waiting patiently. Uh, and perhaps you, uh, you know, want to I want to give you a chance to add some of your thoughts into this as well. Um, but, you know, kind of put it in this context. You sh can you share maybe a little bit, you know, what is perhaps Israel's policy in terms of the Palestinians? Uh, we know, you know, Bibi has been considered in the past, uh, you know, Mr. Security. Uh, but, you know, is there a clear policy towards the Palestinians today with this current government? Well, I'm sure Jonathan can add to this, too, because he learned a lot. I will tell you, 
um, which I think is mind boggling because I live in Israel. I love Israel. I think Israel has done remarkable things. So I'm putting this aside, okay? On the question of the Palestinian, which is a defining question for Israel, right? If you talk about the number of Palestinians between the, the Jordan uh, River and the Mediterranean Sea, there is no strategic, I don't, no one knows what the Israeli strategy is. The Israeli strategy has been not just of this government, of Netanyahu's previous government and, and Bennett Lapid government, kicking the can down the road which is basically we will try to uh, move things around in the hope that something will change and and you know not not uh, making a decision is also making a decision not charting a course for it is also uh, something i i will say that I think Netanyahu has been uh, super careful and in many ways he's continuing the previous uh, government's uh, policy, uh, civil coordination, work permits for, for 17,000 uh, Gaza, uh, Gaza residents that come to work in Israel, 150, 100, I think it's 150, 160,000 Palestinians from the West Bank who work in Israel. This continues. Uh, there's There are economic projects that are continuing. Uh, there's an, an uh, at least the civil coordination uh, I, I don't think uh, Netanyahu and this government wants a war. Um, and also with Gaza, we saw some, you know, Israeli response to um, uh, to strikes from Gaza, which 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 also continues the previous uh, government's policy. However, and this I think this I'll, I'll end with this. Um, there are people in the government, important coalition partners, that don't want the situation. And I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read uh, Betzalel Smotrich, who is now transportation, he's a minister, uh, the economics minister, but he's, he's also a minister in the uh, defense ministry. So there are two ministers now. Um, so I read his plan. It's called the determination plan. It's available also in English. I read it to... I don't know, two years ago, three years ago. And basically what he says is that the Palestinians, and it's black on white, right? The Palestinians can enjoy being second-class citizens in Israel. There will be no Palestinian entity. They can be second-class citizens in Israel. And if they are unhappy with it, we will encourage them to move to Jordan or to other countries, which in other words, it's transfer. And if not, there will be violence. And, you know, this comes from, he's a real ideologue. Netanyahu is not even close to that. There are many people in the government who are not close to that. But 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 there is a push that their their um, their key partners in this coalition that not only would not shed a tear if the Palestinian Authority collapses. It's 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 their agenda, and, and they wrote it. It's not there's no hiding. And I don't. I spoke with Smotrich after he he published this plan. He's he's very proud of it. So this this is dangerous. It's playing with fire, literally. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. I'll let you uh, jump into this conversation. Yeah, thanks, and and Shira, great to see you. Uh, if only um, in two dimensions. Um, I look a, a few things. You know, when, when we talk about the 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 Israeli strategy on the Palestinians, I think it's important to note here that there's a history that leads up to this moment, right? And and it's really hard to ignore the history. And I think from the Israeli perspective in particular rank and file Israelis who went through the Oslo process, the optimism that began, you know, with that handshake on the on the White House lawn back in 1993, the evolution of uh, of peace and the, the the close cooperation with the United States, only to watch the whole thing collapse in 2000. This is not ancient history, by the way. I mean, in some in some ways, it feels like it because it feels like it was like a bygone era. But this is we're talking about 23 years ago when the peace on the peace process collapsed. OK, and then you had after that an intifada that lasted from 2000 to 2005, a campaign of violence and suicide bombings and, and just horrific actions taken by the Palestinians at a moment where the Israelis were prepared to yield something like 97 or 98 percent of the West Bank. It was rejected outright. OK, now, ever since then, what we've had is a uh, really uh, a, a two pronged problem. One is that uh, the Israelis, even after the Intifada, decided that they were willing to gamble on giving the Palestinians the Gaza Strip. It was taken over by force by Hamas. And ever since then, it has been a terror state. And so it's a constant reminder that uh, yielding land unilaterally to the Palestinians 
is not an answer, right? It cannot be done unilaterally. There has to be a partner. And so it's a constant thorn in the side of Israel as they try to grapple with the problem of Hamas, okay? The other problem that I think is no less problematic is that the current leadership of the Palestinians is not leadership at all. I mean, we're talking about Mahmoud Abbas, who has been in power since 2005, okay? He is 18 years into a four-year term. Um, the guy is not leaving unless he leaves on a gurney out of the Mukata in Ramallah. And so when you look at what's going on on the Israeli side, yeah, you could say that there are things that you don't like about what various coalition partners are saying, but I don't see answers, right? I just don't see any opening right now, probably not until Mahmoud Abbas leaves the scene, willingly or unwillingly, breathing or not. I think that's probably when we begin to see possibilities begin to open. Until then, yeah, I think you're going to see Israelis holding fast status quo. And look, the only other thing that I'll just add in response to Shira, I, I don't doubt that there are things that have been written or said by the likes of uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir, Vitsal el Smotrich, or any of their ilk. I don't think there's any question about that. Their designs on the West Bank, I think, are clear. Um, and I think, by the way, they're born of, of ideology, but they're also born of circumstance. And we can't ignore those circumstances that over the years, the lessons that they have learned, whether they're accurate or not, but their takeaways I think, have left a, a searing imprint in their minds and in the minds of their followers. But even despite all of that, it's not policy when somebody thinks a certain way. The policy is enacted by the prime minister and by the security cabinet. And so if Netanyahu makes these moves and he begins to annex the West Bank, Okay, you know, then we can say we've got a problem. This isn't about business as usual, by the way. This is just simply about holding governments accountable for the actions that they take. Right now, there's a lot of indication of what individuals would like to do. I'll just give you one example, and I'll and I'll end there. But you know, uh, back in 2020, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, influenced by right wing ideologues. Uh, inside his uh, inner circle, inside his coalition, were trying to provoke him to annex parts of the West Bank. And he was very tempted to do so. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, the UAE intervened. They offered peace as uh, an alternative. They offered normalization as an alternative. It was binary for Bibi. Either he annexed uh, parts of the West Bank, or he made peace with the UAE. Ultimately, I think Bibi proved himself to be a pragmatist. He may have done it with ambivalence. He may have done it with still hope in his heart that he could still uh, deliver the annexation of parts of the West Bank, but he did the right thing at the end of the day. This is what I continue to hope uh, that we will see. Now, hope is not a policy, but I think that right now, there is no policy. So we're going on what we would like to see coming out of this government. I think Bibi's not dumb. I think he sees the concern all around the world, the concerns that he hears from the United States. And so let's hope that pragmatic Bibi continues to prevail. Great. Um, thanks, Jonathan and Shira, both of you. Um, you know, I, well, first I want to, you know, I want to try to address some of the questions in the Q&A. And, and actually some of them are actually referring a little bit to the judicial developments, and I'm going to kind of, in a sense, push those aside a little bit because we will be discussing this in our next webinar next week. Um, but I kind of also want to shift delicately between the internal and external um, developments. Um, and, you know, we haven't really talked about Iran yet. And, you know, you spoke a little bit about Iran in your opening, Jonathan. Uh, you know, what, what's the current policy about Iran? You know, Ambassador Ross last week mentioned that Iran has now I think you mentioned about 16 facilities um, of 60% enriched uranium, um, which is very close to the 90% threshold. Um, what, you know, what, what's the policy, what should Israel's policy be now uh, towards Iran? What should, you know, how should the, you know, the current US administration act as well? Since we know, as, as you mentioned, you mentioned earlier that the, the deal is kind of dead, the JCPOA is, you know, dead. So, what should we do going forward uh, in terms on, on that on that front? First of all, I said it was mostly dead. Um, uh, but Ed, look, look, um, I think that 
uh, you want to talk about a country that doesn't have a policy. Um, the U.S. does not have an, an Iran policy right now, and and that that is, um, I think, very unfortunate. Uh, we were uh, pushing very hard. When I say we, I mean the White House, the State Department, pushing very hard to re-enter the uh, 2015 nuclear deal or some variation thereof. Um, and then uh, when the Iranians rejected it and diplomacy failed, I think we were holding out hope. Uh, our, our officials were holding out hope that they may be able to return if we just put it on ice. Then the protests broke out. Um, and then we're watching some of these dangerous moves being made by Iran. Um, and uh, look, if you ask me what I think the policy should be, I believe that it should be a return to maximum pressure. It should be a return to the sanctions policies. By the way, not of the Trump administration. A lot of people mistakenly point to the Trump administration as uh, the, the, the presidency that put the most pressure on Iran. Look, they may have taken it to different levels, but this was actually a policy that was born during the Obama administration, that it was the first half of the Obama administration where they put uh, a massive amount of pressure, unprecedented pressure on Iran that ultimately forced them to the negotiating table. And that's where we need to return to, in my, in my view, that those sanctions need to be imposed. They need to be imposed yesterday. And then on top of that, the Mabam, as we call it, the war between wars that Israel is waging in the shadows every night, that needs to continue. And I think it probably should continue with the help of the United States. I think there are probably ways of escalating some of that asymmetric activity to continue to erode Iran's capabilities, conventional or otherwise. The goal should be that Iran, uh, at some point, should uh, see its its uh, its current outlook as futile. The idea that it can continue to threaten Israel and the United States and other re uh, actors around the region, that they need to see that if they continue to do it, it's only going to be detrimental to them. Because at the end of the day, this regime is interested in really one thing, and that is self-preservation and survival. So we need to threaten that directly uh, by ourselves, with Israel and perhaps with other partners. That should be our policy. We are far from that right now. And my hope anyway is that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see a meeting of the minds between Netanyahu and uh, and Biden. Of course, the biggest hindrance to that is I think exactly what Shira pointed out, that the ambivalence right now that we see on the part of this administration about some of the figures in this government and some of the things that have been said may give the United States pause. And it could be a stumbling block toward what is needed here uh, in terms of joint uh, joint policy. But uh, Adam, is it okay if I respond? I think sure. that the fact that we saw, you know, CIA uh, Chief right, Bill Burns in Israel and, and uh, National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan and then uh, Blinken. And during these times there were uh, strikes here on when US visitors high level visitors here and uh, Israel did it was not a surprise to the US i think it actually sent a signal that i i i think is positive of of coordination on that front so yeah. i i hope we can i hope the us and israel um and notwithstanding the concerns that this administration could have on uh, about israel which i'll get to in a moment but i i i hope that on iran they can continue to coordinate you know, I agree uh, with John in a sense, you know, the, the JCPOA is, is mostly dead. We can argue about the merits of this, you know, the, the most benefits of, 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 of this agreement were, uh, were uh, you could, you could, you know, the benefits were, were timed and, and we're not in that time window again. And I think it's very difficult with, with this administration that with the brutal, uh, oppression uh, at home, right? To give them those those rewards. And, and not, it's not just countries in the region, right? With their assistance to Russia. I mean, it really, they really operated here in ways that are uh, uh, hurting them on the global stage. And, and, it, and it's a good thing. Um, maximum pressure, uh, how you do it more effectively uh, than it was done before. I think that's important. The way, and you're exactly right, uh, John, right? It was the Obama administration. You, arguably, the, those crippling sanctions were um, an, 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 incredible, an incredible threat, right? A credible military threat um, helped bring Iran to agree to an, to, to an agreement, to, to uh, the JCPOA. 
Uh, we can argue about whether it's a good agreement or not, but the fact is it's an agreement that Iran agreed to, and now they're not agreeing. So it's either the absence of the credible uh, the credible threat and the absence of uh, those crippling sanctions in ways, or the Iranians themselves have found ways to uh, to uh, to to handle. Right? They can. Uh, they have China, <laughs> and they. They have Russia and they have other players that they can they can you know that they're 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 pretty good they're pretty agile they they know how to work they're in survival mode um so we just need to find uh, ways to do these things um in, including uh, of course the this military uh power short of the, the big strike uh which which is not in the cards at the moment, um, in ways that would be effective and would lead to a change in Iranian behavior and not just hurt them. And the change in Iranian behavior is is just not something we're seeing. Um, so I think I think it's 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 a real challenge. Um, and we, you know, I say this with great sadness. I know it's provocative, so it's not what I'm I'm planning for, right? But I think Israel, and I'm sure there are discussions like that, and the U.S. They should make all the plans to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. But I think we should have the contingency plan and what types of containment if we if we cross the if we cross the point. Is it going to be another North Korea? I mean, I hope not. Can we are there lessons learned from other places? I'm not, I'm not talking about deterrence. It's not going to be a Cold War situation because this war is not cold. But I mean uh, this is this is a scary scenario, and 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 we have to plan for it while we are trying to uh, prevent it. Um, I will say on Blinken's remarks, John. I don't know if you remember mentioned it. I think what was most striking to me, you know, usually U.S. officials come to Israel and they say like the usual, blah blah blah, we love you, and we'll continue to work with. And the fact that he made comments specifically about the democratic nature of Israel and and how democracy is achieved and maintained. You know, these are not comments I've ever heard in Israel. You don't hear them when Blinken goes to France or to New Zealand or to other allies and partners. Um, so, so I think there's definitely concern in Washington. I agree uh, with you, John, that we need to judge uh, it based on policies, but it's okay to, to, you know, to raise red flags and, and warning signs before, right, irreversible things happen. Um, thanks, Jerry. Yeah, and, and you know, we are you know getting close to the top of the hour, and we uh, haven't really got into a lot of the other topics we wanted to talk about. But you know, perhaps we can maybe we can talk for you know two three minutes about other external relations, regional relations between Israel and other Arab nations in the region uh, and their cooperation. You know, following the Abraham Accords. Uh, again, I mentioned Sudan in my opening remarks. So. Perhaps are there any developments on that front that we can talk about and discuss for a minute or two? Jonathan, do you want to try and take that? Sure. Um, look, uh, normalization is going well, um, all things equal. Uh, not perfectly, but well. Uh, things are, are blossoming with the UAE primarily. Um, Bahrain is still uh, warm. Um, and Morocco is uh, warm enough, I would say. The people-to-people -people connections are good, even though maybe some of the other things are are still, you know, uh, lagging. But I, I think there's still lots of room for development there. There's a nice runway. Um, Sudan, uh, I think, look, it was important, and Sudan remains important because it used to be um, it, basically a way station for Iranian weapons on their way to the Gaza Strip. It no longer is. Um, this is a friendly country to Israel. The problem is, is um, I believe the technical term in Hebrew is it's a balagan. Um, the country is not, um, it, th there is no stable rulership right now. There is a, a power contest that continues. And so even though uh, that meeting took place and even though uh, signals were sent, I don't know if we can say for sure that Sudan is on the right path. Um, it's probably easier to say that with Chad right now, um, uh, somewhat ironically. And so that's, um, th those are, I think, but all, all things equal, these are good signs. I think the Saudis are quietly moving in the right direction from all indications. And we're very pleased to see that because uh, as the Saudis go, so will the Middle East. Um, if the Saudis take that step, and, and I think they're interested, I think they're intrigued. 
Um, if they go in the right direction, oh man, you can just imagine what the Middle East will look like. Shimon Paris will be beaming from beyond. Uh, the man who talked about you know the new Middle East. This would be a new Middle East. Um, the two negative things that I'll just point out here, actually maybe only one. I mean, Egypt is fine um, as one of the original peace partners. It's not great. The rhetoric is still not great, but the partnership with Israel on security matters and in containing Hamas and the Gaza Strip it's it's good. It's good enough. And I think the Israelis are quite happy in that bromance between Bibi and Sisi continues, uh, despite the fact that there are some, you know, sort of there's chilly rhetoric coming out of Egypt. That's not as concerning to me as the last issue that I'll flag. And that is that Jordan, which was once the warmest peace in the Middle East, is now the coldest. They are signaling things in every wrong way that one can imagine, uh, truly embracing the Palestinian cause, perhaps even more than the Palestinians themselves, um, and um, rejecting the Negev summit process, not getting involved in the Abraham Accord structures that were created after those agreements were signed. The Jordanians didn't even come to the White House lawn signing um, uh, back when the Abraham Accords were signed. So you get a sense that things are not well um, and, and by the way, just as a final note, Bibi and Abdullah are not friends. Uh, so the rise of Bibi is going Even to add. Even though we've seen a meeting between them. You know, yes, the they met recently. They met about a week ago. Um, and I think that was a positive sign. It's showing effort on the part of Netanyahu. But I think the king's disdain for Netanyahu cannot be masked. And, uh, and so I think there are some challenges ahead. I actually just recently wrote a research memo for FTD on this. It's called Neither Here Nor There, um, Jordan and the Abraham Accords. And you get a sense of the ambivalence that the Jordanians have. It'll be important that you know Israel not lose peace partners as it looks to gain them. That is an important element of the strategy here and one that I would just underscore for all of us to watch. Thanks, Johnson. And of course, you know, we've seen over the past month, you know, tensions uh, over Temple Mount as well, uh, which kind of perhaps contributes to this tension between Israel and, and, the, and the Jordanians. Um, you know, Shia, I want to offer you an opportunity as well to offer, um, you know, some final uh, thoughts on, you know, everything we've spoken about you know, over this hour. Um, please. Sure. I, I mean, I just, I, I agree with John. You know, I think that the normalization is 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 going well. I think uh, the challenges with Jordan are clear, and and Saudi uh, is clearly clearly on the right path. And it looks more of a question of when rather than if. But I think there's a sense um, that you could really uh, bifurcate, wall off the the Palestinian issue from the normalization, and you can't. You know, when, when even with the United Arab Emirates, after you have a uh, um, uh, military operation, which you have civilian civil casualties, uh, they go to the UN Security Council among the first countries, right? You can't even, and this is with the UA, when 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 ties are the best, uh, really, and it's, it would be difficult to um, deepen and expand those ties if the situation with the Palestinians uh, continues to deteriorate. And um, at Israel Policy Forum, uh, we wrote uh, a report when it was one year to normalization agreements. And we tried to say like, okay, can we use the normalization agreements to bring the Palestinians in to, to affect a positive change also on the Palestinian front? And, you know, we had several recommendations and one, one section is on, on the Saudis. And clearly in, in Netanyahu indicated in, previous, in several interviews that this is clearly the priority. And so, the idea is maybe how it's not Arab peace initiative. It's not no one's going to divide Jerusalem for for uh, peace with the Saudis. We're we're not in this universe anymore. But how can uh, prog progress with the Saudis can help ensure at least uh, no harm is done? Okay, so like the Emiratis uh, help prevent annexation. Maybe the Saudis can help uh, prevent a, a change in status quo in Temple Mount or home demolitions or really. Um, uh, uh, break of the Palestinian institutions. I agree with John completely. The Palestinian government is not a Palestinian, it's a government that doesn't provide services for its people. The leadership is 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 not effective. I'm trying to use a, not, not to use profanity, uh, but the institutions are important to preserve. And, and how do um, 
how do we do this? How do we bring uh, partners along? And, and, and I see uh, quite a few opportunities around areas that are deemed a little bit softer, uh, climate change, uh, water, food security. Um, the the MENA uh, climate change conference is going to happen, take place in Riyadh this year. It's a UN conference. Israelis are, have to be invited because, because the UN conference. There are ways to bring those countries around uh, uh, challenges uh, that are common, that are, uh, that the Palestinians cannot uh, basically isolate themselves from. So it's a lower hanging fruit. And maybe, maybe, maybe we can use uh, these topic, with these issues for, for de-escalation on other fronts as well. Great, thank, uh, thank you, Shira and, and Jonathan. You know, thank you both really for, you know, your insights and, you know, thoughtful analysis on, you know, these developments in Israel and in the region. Uh, you know, I really would recommend everyone here to, you know, go ahead and read some of, some of these reports written both by FDD and by IPF, uh, really, you know, um, very thoughtful, um, you know, pieces and, um, you know, thought provoking. Uh, so, you know, we will continue closely to follow the developments um, and how things un unfold in Israel and in the region. And I would like to remind everyone that a recording of today's webinar will be uploaded to the JCRC's YouTube page. Um, and that part three in our webinar series, uh, Judicial Reform and Implications for Israeli Democracy, will take place next Wednesday, February 15th at 11 a.m. Eastern.